Life in high poverty neighborhoods is a life of total uncertainty. You never know what's going to happen from not just one day to the next. You just don't know exactly what's going to happen from morning to afternoon. Those who have the least amount of time are the poor. Their life is governed by things they cannot control. I was born in Jackson Ward on Clay Street um, in 1952, next door to the house that my grandfather owned. I always remember that everyone knew each other. Everyone looked out for each other. If someone were sick, everyone took turns around the block, maybe sitting up through the night for that sick person, because that person would also do the same for you. So before we had health insurance, that was the way the community worked. My experience in life has been blessed. I have been in the presence or trained by people who lived through the glory days of Jackson Ward. The culture of Jackson Ward was that of economic independence, both in black-owned banks, black-owned insurance companies, black-owned companies. President Dwight Eisenhower's legacy for the United States was because he was into developing the interstate system. And the interstate system was designed to cut right through Jackson Ward at that time. One route would not have displaced anybody. It would not have disrupted any neighborhood, black or white. But rather it was a conscious decision to locate that expressway right through the heart of Jackson Ward. Living in segregation, the pleas of the black community were not going to be heard. And so uh, it seemed to be um, the plan of the downtown City Hall fathers to just go ahead and to slice through that community because it seemed to make sense for what their desires were. And so I-95 then bisects Jackson Ward. One section carries on and thrives until today. The other dilapidates into public housing, crime, and mischief. We have enormously racially identifiable concentrated poverty in Richmond because we planned it that way. And that's the truth. We planned it that way. Jackson Ward right now is nothing like it used to be. Jackson Ward, A, is becoming increasingly white, and B, it's becoming increasingly expensive. Uh, this is one of the neighborhoods that uh, is gentrifying, and particularly with the movement of millennials into the city, uh, all you have to do is drive around in Jackson Ward and you can see the redevelopment. It bears no resemblance to what it was like, frankly, just 20 years ago. As neighborhoods gentrify, the term progress is usually associated with that gentrification. But the broader question is progress for whom? Is it for the new residents who are moving in, young, upward mobile couples? Or is it progress for those who are being displaced? I would argue that it's the former. 
and that it's not progress, it's actually a retreat for those who have to move out. Um, so I think the balance can be difficult at times, but in reality, it's just about making sure that you're highlighting both you know, the positive things that are happening, but also just taking it back to the history. You know, where did this neighborhood start? How can we make sure that we're always really looking out for those people that have been here from the beginning? Because they're the reason that the neighborhood is going where it is. Uh, you know, Quirk Hotel has been something that has brought a lot of tourists to the area, which brings in money for our city. Um, Quirk Hotel is just something that is bringing in people from all over the world. It's a double-edged sword. There are really wonderful things that occur. Uh, we're seeing all this entrepreneurial spirit with new businesses popping up almost daily. We see new uh, collaborative efforts in the arts and, and, and um, outdoor activities, things, festivals and all that are going on. Um, and, and you can feel the energy uh, that is just, it, it's measurable uh, in, in the city right now, which is exciting. There's a cultural um, tension that also occurs where you have historical uh, neighbors who've been there for 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years um, who want to preserve their history and their heritage um, and their legacy in a neighborhood as they're seeing newcomers come in and say, well, we don't like the way that is and we're gonna change things. Um, and, and we've seen that's going on right now. But generally, uh, when gentrification occurs, the market is not equitable. And the market does not take people's feelings and their history into, um, in, into mine, it really is the highest and best use of the real estate that's there. I feel that, you know, it, it is unfair to, to skyrocket the, the interest rate in the mortgages, especially when you're not raising, pay, giving pay increases or, you know, raising minimum wage so that families like myself can afford these houses. Our role um, basically as a housing authority is to pro provide safe, decent, and affordable housing. Uh, in the Jackson Ward area, our largest property is our Gilpin Court property. We also have you know, several other properties throughout the city. So I would say that we are one of the primary landlords in the city of Richmond. We're responsible for any maintenance repairs. Um, the resident is only charged for those repairs if the damage was not due to normal wear and tear. You know, the end of the ceiling is cracking. Yeah, yeah baseboards are falling Moving off. You know, yeah, more. my daughter don't want to sleep in her room because when it get, gets cold, outside it may be you know warmer in the house so it builds moisture and her wall her whole wall gets molded so we have to take some bleach spray down and clean it and um you know just kind of try to get it up so we won't have to worry about her getting sick we have categories that we put the work orders in. Some things are an emergency, so we need to repair those within 24 hours. Some things are urgent, we need to repair those in 48 hours. If it's a routine work order, we have up to 21 days to fix that. So that kind of determines our response time. Mm -hmm. But we're always going to fix it because we have an obligation to make sure that the units are safe, decent, and in sanitary repair. When it started getting cold, we didn't have heat. So my daughter and um, the kids kept getting sick because we were cold and we kept telling them, calling them, no heat, no heat, no heat. It doesn't matter to them because they, they don't have to be here. They don't have to live here. Ironically, here you've got Gilpin Court, you know, close to downtown. Um, and yet, um, what you're finding Gilpin Court is very low employment. 
uh, accessing employment is difficult. Gilpin Court has always been a focus area because I look at Gilpin Court as one of the volcanoes. It concerns me that we've seen an increase in crime. And then if I am living in Gilpin Court and I know that, you know, there are drug dealers in the area, do I put myself out there to, uh, you know, to be that exposed? So I call the police and the police come in and they ar arrest that person. Now I have a, a, a healthy fear about my presence in that area and I have to live there. They live in fear. High crime, and this is true whether you live in public housing or not. You know, for me, for my family, we don't have a choice but to live here, though, you know, until we can do better. So I just try to keep them safe in the home and, you know, make sure that they look out for each other and, you know, be aware of their surroundings. Um, all, the, all the things that, you know, you got to teach, you know, to teach a child, you know. Oops, you want there are times when we, we, we in the house and, you know, we just randomly might hear, you know, gunshots and stuff. And the, the kids, really, you don't have to tell them anymore because that's just how, you know, bad it's gotten. They just automatically know that they get down. But then the next thing they do, they look for each other and make sure everybody all right. And then I'm, I'm calling names if I'm not in the room or I'm getting up, you know, really risking myself because I want to make sure my children are all right. My daughter is three and now she know, get down, mom, get down. You want me to get down? So that's the reason why I'm trying to do what I'm trying to do to get in a more suitable, you know, living a neighborhood, a living environment. Um, that can be conducive for my family and my children, you know, most importantly, because they shouldn't have to be raised nowhere and say, is it time to get down? Do we have to get down? They shouldn't have to be, you know, around that. I don't want them, I just don't want them to live like that, you know? I want them to be able to have a memorable upbringing, a memorable childhood, something that they can reflect on that's positive, something that they can feed to their children when they do have children. So they can, you know, they, I want them to see the beauty in life because it is some beautiful things out here, you know? And they just gotta, I mean, we went, we went to Brown's Isles one day to go to Brown's Isles and just be in a space where everybody just having fun, doing what they do. We went there and we played kickball in the middle of the field. And we had so much fun. It was a peace of mind. And we won't ducking. We won't worrying about, you know, how people felt while we were having fun. We were engaged with each other and we actually got a chance to enjoy each other. And then as soon as I got home, all of that excitement just weighed down, you know. So I want to go home and still be excited, you know, still want to think about, okay, what's the next thing we're going to do? So that, that, is definitely why we, we making a move that we making today. It's not about culture. As much as we like to say, we'll say it when the lights are on and the cameras are rolling. All right, it's not about history. It is about revenue. And it's, it's been that way for a number of years. And for some reason, money floats to the top of everything now. And it shouldn't be that way. Our focus is distorted, is what it is. And it doesn't take, you know, a ton of money to fix some of the problems we have in our communities. It just takes somebody giving a damn. It's important that people that really care about the issue um, of all colors ask themselves what do we need to do to make changes and how do we make progress. It's not a matter of getting it right, it's a matter of making progress. Those stories are important for the legacy because if people want to have the will to really ask the hard questions of what can we be doing better and how can we make progress so that we don't forget. You have to have the stories 
that helps to capture the imaginations for the next generation. If the stories are not there, the imagination will not unfold. And then it will be lost to the ages and the dollar signs will always win.